and you've been you've been tempted that way. Uh, not really, no. I mean, um, I, I mean, I, I did when I lived in Dublin. There was uh, writers were exempt from tax, and that was, uh, you know. See, the thing is, it's like, it's not about individuals. You can't, you know, the, the, if the system is set up for greed, if if, if, if a system's encouraging people to act on greedy impulses, and you know, human beings are complex characters. They're not only about greed; they're about all sorts of emotions. But if an economic system set up to, to, you know, to, to be based around greed and avarice, you're going to get these outcomes. I mean, human beings are violent, but we don't want to have wars all the time to, to, to satisfy that kind of thing. Uh, we have to have some kind of balance. We have to have some kind of, um, we have to have some kind of controls on, on people's basic instincts. And right now, we don't have that in okay. our global economic you system. In Dublin? Not, so you didn't pay taxes? No, I lived in Dublin because my wife had moved yeah, there. She yeah. got a visa. Just, she was doing college. It sounded like you, you well, a lot, well, no, but hang on. A lot, a lot of artists and writers did move to Ireland because it had a special tax regime remember, for a um, period, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, I remember saying to Roddy Doyle, a great Irish writer in a pub one time, he says, how can, you, how can you live here and not pay tax? You know, you know, that's immoral. He's born and bred there. Mm -hmm. you know, the, guy, the guy that's pulling your pint of Guinness is paying uh, 50 pence or, or, or 50 euro in the... You know, you know, sort of uh, an exorbitant amount anyway. And there I was, you know, there I was when I moved to Dublin. I thought, well, every other writer here isn't paying tax, so I should, I should do the same thing, you know. And you're, you are, when the system is kind of rigged up like that, you are in the position that uh, you're a mug if you don't take advantage of it. And what did he it. say? What did he say? He just laughed in my face and said, now that you're here, you'll take advantage of it. And he was right, because that is the way the system okay. is, that the system operates. But the system shouldn't operate like that. Okay. The system shouldn't be about somebody who has money deciding that they want to take part in it or not, somebody deciding that they can solve their conscience by, putting money into, by giving money to charities, like I did myself. It's not enough. It's people should be compelled to pay the, the correct amount right. of tax. Douglas Carswell. Pe people are absolutely right to feel a sense of, a sense of anger. The lady at the back said, would the government go after um, the people not paying their tax the same way they would someone who was fiddling benefit? I happen to be helping a woman in my constituency today who's been traced by HMRC and bailiffs for their mistake in overpaying her child's tax credit. I hope they go after some of the people who've not paid their full share of tax in, 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 in Panama and the BVI. But the question is, what, what do we do about it? Um, Unless we're going to colonise every small island on the planet and impose a system of world government, we are going to have to, I think, recognise that we, we can't stamp out tax havens. So what do we do to minimise the damage and minimise uh, this unjust system? First thing to do is, is to push tax havens to disclose. And in fairness to David Gork, and I don't want to trigger the squabble again, but David Gork, um, the current Treasury Minister, has actually done some pretty good stuff in terms of pushing some of these havens. BVI, for example, now has to report information to 29 tax jurisdictions, tax authorities. It didn't previously have to do that. But the second thing we have to do is remove the incentive for people to want to use a tax haven in the first place. Now, we in this country have had, in effect, four budgets in the past two years. Every time there's a budget, George Osborne stands up and he announces whose wealth he's going to try and grab. It could be people who've invested in buy-to-let. It could be people's pension pots. It was pasties at one stage. Uh, perhaps if we had less arbitrary tax and a lower tax, there wouldn't be this incentive to do this. If I could... But surely still, I'm sorry, I don't stop you, but I mean, if there's an opportunity of paying no tax, however low the tax <laughs> is, if Irving's <laughs> right, people will go for the but no tax if, if, instead of the low tax. If you tax. remove the incentive, you will well, minimise... What's the incentive? The incentive is 10% tax, 20% tax, 30% tax? Well, oh. if, if you push tax jurisdictions to disclose, I don't think people would be willing to All take right. that risk, would they? All right. Hold on a second. Well, let me hear from the man in spectacles on the gangway there. You, sir. Uh, You're the right. reason I'm asking, the uh, problem is, it, we used to have Exchange Control Act, 1947, which was controlling the movement of money. So why we don't bring that uh, act back again? Well, why was it ever repealed? Yes. The, the Thatch government repealed it in 79. I think yes. I'm right, aren't I? That, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you Allow are. Right. Yes, yeah, I'm right. Actually, along with a whole series of other things which deregulated, you know, this is one of the things that the Thatcher bequests to the modern era is that they deregulated so much that this was an inevitable result, in okay. my view. The man, the man up there, I'll come back again. I think it's an increasing perception in this country that there's a ruling class that is somehow beyond the law. Uh, and actually untouchable. And because of the ruling class, they kind of can preserve things for themselves. I'm concerned that this country is kind of becoming less democratic 
because those in the corridors of power can just manage things to, to ensure the perpetuation. Anna Subra, do you want to answer that point? No, I, 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 as I said, I mean, I, th you know, there is, I don't think we disagree that you know, in the last government we collected an additional £2 billion of money because we tied up 40 of these loops that en enabled people who should have been paying tax not to pay them. And we've got another 25 measures. Uh, and if you speak to people who have used devices to avoid paying taxes, they will tell you how the taxman absolutely is now coming after them. And we've seen in the last five years, as I say, £2 billion extra money coming in from people who've avoided it. And we've actually got a general duty that means to say these sorts of avoidance schemes are no longer allowable. And I have to say that under... And, and I'm not, I don't want to do all this squabbling, but it, it has to be said... But now you're that, going to. But no, it's a fact, though, that under the last Labour government, there were all sorts of schemes that were absolutely promoted in order for people to defer their taxation uh, and not pay it at the right time. And I'm afraid that is an absolute Look, fact. The, the truth is, I think, that the moment you close one loophole or introduce a tax, somebody will employ a lawyer somewhere to try and find a way around it. So the truth is that all the political parties should be getting together and agreeing that we want to put an end to this. Um, I think David Cameron's example this week hasn't been brilliant on transparency, if I'm honest. Um, and, and I think it, it's not just about the tax arrangements, it's also about knowing who owns what. Because I think it's quite interesting but we've changed how the much um, the, um, United, the President of the United Arab, Mer Arab Emirates owns in London. We only know that because of this revelation yes, now. Right. And actually, a lot of countries, other people in other countries in the world are furious with their leaders who've been stealing money from them, oh, yes, squirrelling it away, taking it away elsewhere. And we, all political parties in this country, we should be making sure right. that our and overseas exactly territories are the best You mentioned... You, uh, we're you, doing you, I'll come to you. Just, just come back to the Prime Minister who you mentioned. Do you think he has now explained sufficiently for your purposes his tax affairs to satisfy you that there has been no wrongdoing and no tax avoidance on his part? I, I mean, it's just been classic Cameron, hasn't it? It's had to be dragged out of him like by wild horses. I mean, in fact, talking of wild horses, it's just like, do you remember when he said he'd never gone riding with Rebecca Brooks? And then, oh, maybe he had gone riding, but he couldn't remember whether Re Re Rebecca Brooks was there. Oh, yes, and then in the end he could remember. He couldn't even remember the name Sorry, of the But are you satisfied with what So it's exactly what, is... what we've had this week. Are, are you satis satisfied no, of course, with what's I'm been not said satisfied. now? And I don't suppose a single person in the country is satisfied. Um, he, he, at the beginning of the week, he said it was just a personal matter. Then he said and we, that he wasn't benefiting at all now. Then he said he and his family weren't benefiting. And then he said that we're not going to benefit in the future. He just forgot to mention the bit that they had been benefiting in the past. But he hasn't done anything wrong. It's just, why didn't he own up at the beginning? If he hasn't done anything wrong, why didn't he own up at the beginning? Why didn't he lay it all out well, can, clearly? Can we, can we just establish something? The Blair Moore Holdings, and forgive me, David, I think you were putting that into the same category as the tax avoidance schemes and offshore dealings. Blair Moore Holdings was actually an investment trust, perfectly legitimate. Uh, Robert Peston and others have written about the legitimacy of it. In fact, I understand in 2006 it actually the produced... Legality. Now, hang on, Chris, this is very important, so let me just finish. 2006, for example, they published a brochure, so investors could invest in it, and you paid tax, and you paid capital gains tax, and that's exactly what David Cameron did. In 2010, when he became Prime Minister, he got rid of his holdings in it, he paid the tax on that, capital gains tax, he hasn't done anything wrong, and it's never he been... Did it. Hang on, Chris, you're interrupting, because it's very important. If you're talking about tax avoidance, then we can have a debate about that, the morality of it, even the legality. But this is not a tax avoidance scheme. It's an investment trust, open and honest and perfectly right and lawful. There's a big distinction but between that it, and tax avoidance. All right, very well, he did one, it, one last point. That's very just, important. He did it just before the 2010 election. But he hadn't done anything I wonder wrong. why. Well, no, I wonder why. Well, I'll tell you why. Hang on. This, this again, this is again, it's very important. 
This wasn't somebody who had done something wrong and was then getting rid of it. Because he, there, is, there is nothing illegal, morally or legally, about investing in this trust. So nothing why didn't wrong. Why did he say so on so, Monday? Well, yeah, sorry, so yeah, Anna, he uh, got uh, rid of everything Anna. when he became Prime Minister, yeah. and now he's saying, I'm going to publish my tax return, and yeah. other people who are party leaders, let's all do the same. And do I think that's you, good. Do you and just right. want to answer the point that uh, Chris Brown made that it took him a week to get to the point of saying, in the future, his family wouldn't benefit, i.e., maybe in the past? They had by I think, I think, I think, to be honest with you, what happened was that, understandably, the spotlight was put on his late father. Uh, I think he, he was dragged into it and there were smears that were made against him. And I, I have to say, if it had been my father, I think I would have pulled back and, frankly, not wanted to talk about any of it because I'd have found it rather hurtful. Mm -hmm. Just as I may say, I have no interest in... I don't mean to be rude in David Cameron's father any more than I had any interest in Ed Miliband's father. I was much more interested in Ed and I'm much more interested in David and what they stand for and who they are today, not right. about their parents, frankly. Now, OK. I, I've got another... We're going on to another topic, but I promised you I'd let you in, yes. Little Man Always Paid is because David Cameron was asked in April 2012 to publish his tax returns. It's been 1,400 days and he hasn't. We have a Chancellor who can stand proudly. We've been in five years of austerity. We have Google who pay more tax in France. They get more money in Britain. It doesn't add up. We've got disabled people losing £30 a week. If anything, it's because of the current government the Little Man's paying. And until he can actually publish a budget which helps everyone in the country, not just the top percent, nothing's going to change and nothing's going to work. Okay. Well, we've only got a quarter of an hour left. I want to go on to this next very important topic. Here's a question from Caroline Jones, please. Caroline Jones? Yeah. Oh, hello. Um, hello, should, far away. Should, the microphone's should, over your head, don't should worry. Should the government nationalise the British steel industry? Very straightforward question. Should the government nationalise the British steel industry? Mm. Chris Bryant. <coughs> Not necessarily as its first step, but it might need to keep that as a possibility on the table. I think, frankly, um, I represent a seat in South Wales which used to have a single industry that dominated entirely. Coal, it was in my case. And now I, I drive past Port Talbot very frequently, it's, and, and I have constituents who work in the, uh, um, in the steelworks there. I, I would say... For those of you who think we shouldn't bail out steel, just think very, very hard about this. There are pleasant, presently people paying taxes who would then be in receipt of benefits. If we can afford to bail out the banks, we can afford to bail out steel. <laughs> we... Now... I, wouldn't, I don't want us to suddenly go back to the 1940s and say we're going to renationalise steel and keep it forever in, in, in state control. Um, you know, government ministers aren't particularly very good at running businesses. But I do think we should... I think it was wrong of the government to take this off the table. I also think, to be honest, um, that Sajid Javid, when he seems to suggest that this all came as a great old surprise to him... <coughs> I mean, if he'd sat in Prime Minister's questions the week before, when Stephen Kinnock, the MP for Aberavon, who has done a very good job in representing his constituents, said to the Prime Minister, next week there is going to be a, d a decision in Mumbai where they will decide on the future of the steelworks in my constituency. I mean, he could have heard that, and then he might have gone to Mumbai instead of going to Australia. Um, so... I, I, sorry, come back to... Caroline Jones's question, yep. Le leave aside all the other <clears throat> arguments, was should the government nationalise it? And you seem to say, yes, possibly. Well, I, I don't think we should take it off the table, which is what the government is saying. The first thing we need to do is we need to do a proper um, due diligence, get all the facts and the figures in relation to the business um, together. Secondly, we should, be, um, we should stop kowtowing to China. I'm sick and tired of all this business trying to get um, market economy status for China um, when they have been dumping steel of way less than it costs to produce um, and, and taking people out of jobs in this country. Um, their massive power... Incidentally, that's another reason for me why we should stay in the European Union, because I think we only stand up to China if we're alongside our colleagues okay. in the European <laughs> Union. Um, I think we, the government will have to put some money on the table. I'm very proud of Carwin Jones, the leader of the Welsh, um, in the Welsh Assembly, 
um, because he's already put £60 million pounds, um, on the table from the Welsh Assembly. That's a large amount of money in relation to the All right, Welsh and what do you say to what Anna Soubry, sitting on my right, has said, which is nationalisation is an option. Of course, I made clear yesterday we look at all options. I do mean all options. Are you encouraged by the government's reaction? I, 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 I like a lot of the things that mm -hmm. Anna says on, on, on this subject. The, the, the trouble is, um, actually, the implementation of them, because I don't understand why the government was campaigning against tariffs in the European that's Union that other countries that's wanted to impose. Right. Well, let's come true. back to steel. That's not true. And I don't right. know why that's on the 29th true. of oh, February God, Anna voted against think? a motion in the House of Commons oh, and, yeah. and Douglas didn't even bother to turn up. You lose people this by really this kind of thing. Let's just deal, really with the, deal with the question of steel and the future of the steel industry.